Hey everyone, welcome back to She Bars Podcast. Today's guest is Sebastian B. Castell. Did I pronounce it right? Yeah, it's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you pronounce it? You know, I never know how to pronounce it correctly because it's a French name, and but but I've mostly been living in English uh, places most of my life. So I usually, I think I say Sebastian de Castel. Okay, okay, <laughs> that works. <laughs> but they're all perfectly good. There's, there's no... <laughs> so can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm a Canadian fantasy author. Uh, I'm mostly known for uh, two series, The Great Coats, which is a swashbuckling fantasy series that kind of harkens back a little bit to um, not just sort of the Three Musketeers, but 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 some of the kind of the 1930s Hollywood style swashbuckling of Errol Flynn or or more recently of things like The Princess Bride. It's a bit darker than those, but but um, but that's some of the spirit that goes into it. Uh, as well as a series called Spell Slinger, which is a young adult fantasy series that's full of magic and intrigue and betrayal and and kind of hard life choices. Um, and uh, other than that, I think I'm just about the most boring human being alive. I think, <laughs> I think everything else kind of. I used to be kind of interesting, actually. Now, now that now that now that you've asked the question, I, I think I'm going to have like a little uh, emotional crisis right here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, 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 tr I still travel a lot, but I used to do lots of really interesting things. And then I became a novelist. And then it's like all I ever do is try to write the next novel. So <laughs> that's awesome. So can you give our listeners like a brief summary of your novels? Uh, sure. So the the book that's out right now is called Wave the Argosy. And that's a spin-off series that comes from the Spellslinger series. And, and in Spellslinger, there's a character that is one of my favorite characters to write and uh, and kind of a favorite of, of a lot of readers is a, a woman named Farius Parfax. And Farius Parfax is what's called an Argosi. And the, the Argosi are like these very enigmatic, wandering, kind of almost like cowboy philosophers. Um, you know, they, they, they play cards and they swagger and they gamble and they kind of interfere with everything. But they, they have all these very kind of um, secretive plans about what they're doing and why they do it. Um, they they uh, they paint all these different kinds of tarot cards, and they have all these different decks and and things like that. So it's all a lot of a lot of the stuff that I really love. And um, when I finished the Spellslinger series, which is a six book series, um, uh, I'll, people kept writing me about wanting to know how to be an Argosi because they were so kind of enamored of Farius and what she did. And one of the things I love about writing the Argosi is that unlike you know, in a, in a lot of fantasy novels, the 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 sort of the interesting orders of people are are all about magic. You know, so if you think of the Jedi in Star Wars, right? Like you sort of have to be born with a, a kind of an attachment to the Force, and and to be a true Jedi, you kind of have to divorce all of your human feelings a, a lot. You know, and I've I've never really liked that because I I quite like human beings, strangely enough, and so I wanted to write about people whose uh, all their kind of abilities came from uh, very human things uh, taken to the, the highest level. So eloquence, for example, right? When you think of like the way that we can communicate and the way that if you learn to communicate really well, um, you, can, you can reach so many different people and you can be more persuasive or perception, right? If you think of Sherlock Holmes, right? That's not magic. Uh, I mean, it's, it's still fantastical, but it's, it's not magic per se, right? He's Right. He's kind of using the human mind um, or dance, right? Dance, music, uh, all of these things are amazing. So the Argosi are this kind of group of people who who learn to take these talents, what are called the seven talents, to these very high levels. And so I was getting all these fan letters of people going, I want to know how to be an Argosi. And I was like, well, they're fictional, so I don't think we can <laughs> really all make ourselves Argosi, but I suppose we could try. And so um, I started writing a book called The Way of the Argosi, which is the story of Farius when she was a young woman, when she was first uh, kind of on the run from these very powerful mages who had destroyed her clan, who were trying to kind of experiment on her um, and, and were kind of pretty awful. And so she goes on this very strange path where she tries to find a way to survive in this world that's really set up against her. Uh, and along the way, she meets a man named Earl Brown, who is one of these Argosi. And we kind of start to find out for the first time um, who these Argosi are and how it works and what it means. So there's a it's it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of adventure and a lot of, um, you know, action and things like that. But there's also quite a bit of kind of what I think of as fun philosophy, which is philosophy where you don't 
kind of need a textbook, but it's more built around things I think that we understand a little bit intuitively as human beings. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. So is that where you get your ideas from when you think of your stories? I th I think a lot of the time, I think a lot of writers uh, um, respond to what's going on in, in the world. And I used to say like, because people, people always ask writers, where do you get your ideas from? And writers always say they hate the question, but <laughs> I, I think it is a very fair question. And I think, because I think for a lot of writers or certainly for myself, most of my ideas come from the gap between what I see in the world and what I feel about the world. So you, you see all these things happening. You know, a good example is you'll, you'll see people say, um, you know, the world is incredibly divided, right? Everybody's either left or right or something like that. And sometimes there are very real facts behind that. But sometimes you sort of feel like, well, as a writer, you'll go, well, that doesn't feel right. Like there's something missing from that. And so you'll start to write about a story that kind of deals with that intersection between what everybody is taking for granted and what you feel as a human being might or might not be true. Mm -hmm. So I tend, to, I tend to do a lot of that. And, and so the Argosi are, are, are part of that as, as well, because um, you know, I'm a humanist, I'm an existentialist as a person. I'm, I'm, I'm very old school liberal. Like, you know, I'm, I'm part of the group that thinks you solve all kinds of inequities and injustice by sitting everyone down for tea and having a polite conversation. <laughs> you know, we're, we're much beloved these days. Um, <laughs> but, I, but with the Argos, yeah, I wanted to sort of explore some of that more and, and just, there's a lot of things that we don't tend to believe in very much anymore uh, that were a big deal. Like when I was a little kid, pacifism was a serious political and philosophical perspective. I don't hear anybody talk about pacifism anymore. I only hear people talk about kind of righteous violence. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so one of the things that Farius has to contend with is, is as a character in the way of the Argosi, she has every right to want violence. She has every right to want revenge. Um, but the, the way of the Argosi isn't the way of revenge. And so she has to kind of come to grips with not just what she hopes to gain by learning how to how to do all these amazing things that these people do, but what what's the price of that? And the price isn't, you know, you have to go through some horrible torment or or burn yourself or you know all these kind of rituals that we tend to impose on, on ourselves in in culture. Um, but the price is having to give up something that she, you know, really does have a right to, which is the right to try to avenge the wrongs done to her. Wow. That's amazing. So what does your family think of your writing, of your novels that you just came out with? Uh, I think they're glad that I'm gainfully employed. Um, <laughs> the, uh, my, my, wife, uh, my wife has always been a, a big supporter of my writing. She's a librarian. Um, and so, uh, so I think, so she had to be supportive before. And, and now that, you know, my books have done pretty well and they've been translated into, you know, 14 or 15 languages. Um, now she can, every once in a while, she can be cool with uh, <laughs> other librarians because librarians really like authors. Generally, they love books. Um, so that's good every once in a while. So it's because, because normally she's the cool one and I'm sort of the, the hanger on. So every once in a while, I can be slightly cool. <laughs> that's awesome. So when did you realize you wanted to be an author? Um, I think I sort of always wanted to, uh, you know, I, I always feel bad when I answer this question because I, I meet and I hear a lot of authors talk about how they were always writing, like they were six years old when they wrote their first 600 page novel and, you know, they write because they can't not write and it's like air to them. And I'm always like, oh, I feel really lazy because I was doing all these other things. Like I was a musician and for a while I was an actor and I was choreographing sword fights for the theater. And there were, there was lots of things that, that I was sort of doing. Um, but probably when it became serious for me was uh, when I was 27, I was, um, I was in a touring rock band. Um, I was making pretty terrible money. I was making like 250 bucks a week uh, as a, as a musician playing, you know, Mustang Sally and Brown Eyed Girl in every tiny town you can find. Um, and I was being sued uh, or threatened with a lawsuit by the bass player for control of the band. Um, uh, he's a he's a lovely he's a lovely person, and uh, and and we we became friends again after that. But um, but but suffice it to say, I was in a bad creative place. Um, and when I'm in a really bad place, when I when I really don't know what to do, um, I've always uh, gone to the library. Um, 
libraries are, I, I always, I, I'm always amazed when, because sometimes I'll travel to countries where like the UK, which hasn't been, I love the UK, but it, it hasn't been great to its libraries. And I always think like, this is the strangest thing because the libraries are like cathedrals for everyone, right? What? Like that you can walk into a library with no idea what you want to do with your life. You can have no idea what you want to do, what you care about. And everything's there for you. You know, like there's a, an infinite number of choices. And so that's what I did. I was, I was just feeling really down because, you know, I was playing cover music every weekend. My musical aspirations had not therefore, you know, been entirely fulfilled. Um, you two and Coldplay were not calling to ask me if I wanted to join the band. <laughs> um, and I, I found a set of um, cassette tapes in a, in a cardboard box on the sixth floor of Vancouver Public Library. And inside that box were these, these cassette, old cassette tapes. There were two sides and, uh, and it, was a, a, it was a course called uh, Let's Write a Mystery by a guy named Ralph McInerney. And Ralph McInerney is a pretty well-known at the time um, mystery writer. Uh, he wrote these kind of religious mysteries um, and I'm not really a religious person. So it was kind of an interesting mix. Um, and, uh, but he, he, he had this course uh, where he would teach you how to write a novel by writing a novel alongside you. So he was literally on these cassette tapes. He'd say, okay, today, this is what I've written. This is what you need. You got to write something like this. You got to, today you got to create your protagonist and you got to have them do this. And uh, you know, something's got to happen or you got to introduce the mystery. And I didn't know what I was doing, um, but he included his first draft of the novel he was writing in the box. And this was like the most terrible novel I'd ever read. I mean, it was <laughs> awful. But the thing is, Ralph McInerney was a was actually a great writer. And the fact that he was willing to kind of expose what his first draft looked like, that he was willing to show like, hey, here's what it looks like when I just sit there and try and write a book. It's not all great the first time around. It gets better, right? Um, that just motivated me so much. So I wrote the first draft of a, of a novel and I just felt fantastic. And I was like, okay, I've done this. I don't need to do it again. Um, but then a few, six years later, I decided, um, you know what, I'm going to try this again. And that's the, that's the wonderful thing about writing. It doesn't have to happen all in one day. It doesn't have to happen all in one year. Um, and that second book became, uh, the first draft of, of Trader's Blade, which, um, which, uh, years afterwards I, I revised. And then that got me a four book deal, uh, which then got me an eight book deal, which then got me another four book deal, which, Got me a lot of deadlines that I have to meet all the time. <laughs> nice. Well, congratulations. I, I feel like I'm too old to write books. Like, I feel like it's too old for me to start writing. It's it's not at all. Uh, <laughs> Dave Duncan, David Duncan, who was a very prolific fantasy writer. Um, he died a couple of years ago. Uh, he had, uh, he as far as I know, he'd never written anything until he was 50 or 53 years old. Um, yeah, that's the beautiful thing about writing is that um, it's there's a set of skills that anyone can learn because they they come basically from literacy. So if you if you read, you, you've got the skills. You don't necessarily know how to apply them day to day, but you you figure it out. Um, it comes from that mixed with what you've experienced and what you have to say. You know, and the older you get, kind of the more things you've experienced, the more things you have to say. So I sometimes I sometimes will meet someone who's very young, um, who's incredibly skilled at the craft side of writing, um, but they struggle with sort of what to say because yeah. you know they haven't had all the advantages of the, the good thing about getting old is you see the same things happen over and over again, and so you start to go oh that thing that I thought was the most important thing in the world it turns out it wasn't. Uh, it turns out this other thing that I didn't notice was really important to me. Mm -hmm. So the older you get, kind of the more advantages you have in that regards. So there, there's never a, it's never too late to write your novel. So. Oh, okay. I'm not going to give up. I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. So um, who are a few of your favorite authors and have any of them inspired um, a few of your novels? Um. So I have a I have a weird range of of authors that that I that I like. I, I tend to like a lot of um, I like a lot of the noir writers. So Raymond Chandler, uh, I, I just love the way like in terms of just prose, the way that Raymond Chandler wrote was just so fluid and 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 really beautiful. And, and you know he wrote uh, the Big Sleep, and and you know he's the guy that gave us uh, Philip Marlowe, who's sort of the very famous noir detective, private detective. Um, 
when I was younger, I, I really loved a, a fantasy author by the name of Stephen Bruce, who is still writing great books all the time. Um, and I learned a ton just reading his books. It was the first time I'd read a fantasy novel that wasn't full of sort of these and thous. He wrote people, he wrote fantasy characters who spoke kind of the way that people speak, um, which I really appreciated. Um, but some, sometimes I'm inspired by, by uh, television writers, um, not so much television shows, but sometimes a television writer's voice. So Aaron Sorkin, who, who created The West Wing, and I think he did the Chicago 8 uh, recently. I think it was either Chicago 7 or the Chicago 8, I can't remember, but that movie, he, he wrote that. Um, and I love what he does with language and dialogue. So, so that will often inform my writing. In fact, uh, periodically in, in a fantasy novel, I will do a very tiny homage to, to Aaron Sorkin's writing. Nice. Yeah. That's amazing. So what was your hardest scene to write and why? My hardest scene to write? Mm -hmm. It's the interesting thing is that for me, the hardest scenes to write are the trend are sometimes what we think of as transitional scenes. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a bunch of big action happening over here. And then your characters need to get to some castle over there. Mm -hmm. And I will never be sure what to do with that in-between scene. Because one of the things that you have to do when you're writing a novel is at some point, whether, whether at the beginning or, or later or at the end, at some point you're going to have to go through and you're going to have to excise, you're going to have to cut out any scene that isn't doing something important that isn't saying something about the characters or moving the, the plot forward or, or just advancing the theme. And in fact, really almost all scenes have to do all those things. Mm -hmm. And so it's harder to do that when you're writing a scene of just people traveling from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why a lot of the time you'll see those scenes tend to be quite dialogue heavy uh, when you're reading them in a book. Um, and, and sometimes they can feel a little bit superfluous, um, but it's one of the advantages, people are, very, people are so um, attuned to television and movies now and video games. Mm -hmm. One of the advantages that television uh, and movies have is, um, is montage, right? So any one of those scenes where all of a sudden, you know, it's like, a, it's like a, in a boxing movie where the boxer has to train and a whole bunch of time passes and they're like, they're in the, the ring and they're sort of punching or they're jogging or they're doing skipping rope or they're punching sides of beef in a freezer or some weird thing, right? And they put, mash all that together with some music. And so you get time passing without getting bored. Um, well, novels don't really have an equivalent for montage. There's, there's ways you can kind of rig it, but they don't tend to work very well. So, so it becomes very difficult when you know, I need to show a lot of time passing Mm -hmm. but I don't want it to be irrelevant or boring. So those are the scenes that are the hardest for me. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, they do sound kind of difficult. Like, that's the problem with me writing my book. Like, my mind goes everywhere. So as soon as I start it, then it goes to a different subject. And I'm like, why am I on this subject when I need to be focused on this one? It just, that's why it's so hard for me to write a book. <laughs> that's, I, I think that happens to all of us who are writers that, you know, the, there's uh, and and sometimes, sometimes you know, we one of the one of the problems with writers, writers both themselves and because of the way other people talk about writing, to, we tend to beat ourselves up a lot. So we tend to think, oh, this is my fault, right? I, I, you know, I there's you know, when people say there's no such thing as writer's block, there's you know, you're just being lazy or undisciplined, but there really is, right? In the sense that writer's block is basically anxiety. And anxiety, we you know, is a pretty serious thing, and it can make it very, very difficult. You know, you can, sometimes you can feel it in your chest, and it, and it's. I'll find that I'll be I'll be sitting there in front of the computer trying to write a scene, the kind that you're talking about, where your brain just keeps wanting to wander away, and and I'll be I won't even be aware of it, and then I'll and then I'll slowly realize, wait a sec, why is my chest so tight? Yes. And it's because I'm feeling a lot of anxiety, and you have to you you can't cure the anxiety by beating it with a hammer. Right. So, so I, I will tend to sort of say to myself, okay, how about if I just, you know, it's okay. If I feel like I can't handle it right now, I'll just stop for a while. I'll do something else. I'll do, you know, I'll, I'll take a walk or I'll watch YouTube or, or whatever. And I'll just say, look, in half an hour, I'm just going to check in with myself because I waste a lot of time. Um, it's one of the great joys of being a full-time author is that you can spend four hours watching YouTube and call it research. Um, <laughs> 
but I'll, I'll just say in half an hour, I'm going to check in with myself. And so half an hour, I'll sit in front of the keyboard again. And I'll go, do I feel like I can just try a sentence? And if I feel that tension there, if I, you know, I'll just go, all right, you know what? I'm not ready yet. And it, but eventually, once you once your kind of brain s starts to realize that you're not going to beat it up, that you're not going to force yourself to do something, right? That that it really doesn't want to do, it starts to relax a little bit. And eventually, I, go, I sort of get to the point where I'm like, okay, I'll just write a paragraph. That's a paragraph is not a lot to write in one day. That would be terrible, but that's okay because I'm I'm saying it's okay. And I write that paragraph, and then I'll end up suddenly writing for you know two hours straight and getting four thousand words on the page. So that that's usually what I suggest. Ah, oh, okay. That's that's awesome advice. I want to thank you so much for coming on my show today and allowing me to interview you about your book and being an author. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. You have a great day. You too. Bye bye. Hey everyone, I want to thank you all so much for listening to my podcast and being such great supporters. I really appreciate it. Also, if you would like to check out Sebastian's novels, his books, or what he's up to, or what he's currently working on or has coming out, I have linked his website below. It is tinkering below. So you can check out his website. You can contact him that way. You can purchase his books. You can uh, just follow along with what he's doing and what he has going on in his life. I want to thank you all so much for being a supporter of my podcast and listening to me and, um, you know, messaging me with uh, great support and great advice. And uh, thank you all so much. I really do appreciate it. You all have a great day.